The dinner was steak Diane, and it was served to the four men at a long table in a dining room hung with large old paintings. They were waited on by a series of beautiful young women, and George wondered where the gang leaders kept their wives and mistresses. In some sort of perder, perhaps. There was something Arabic about this whole setup. During the main course, a blonde in a long white gown, which left one breast bare, played the harp in a corner of the room and sang. There was conversation with the coffee. Four young women sat down briefly with the men and regaled them with witticisms and funny stories. With the brandy came Tarantella Serpentine. She was an amazingly tall woman, at least six feet two, with long blonde hair that was piled high on her head and fell below her shoulders. She was wearing tinkling gold bracelets around her wrists and ankles, and there were diaphanous veils wrapped around her slender body and nothing else. George could see pink nipples and dark crotch hair. When she strode through the door, Banana Nose Maldonado wiped his mouth with his napkin and began applauding gleefully. Robert Putney Drake smiled proudly, and Richard Young swallowed hard. George just stared. The star of our little rural retreat, said Drake by way of introduction. May I present Miss Tarantella Serpentine. Maldonado's applause continued, and George wondered if he should join in. Music, oriental, but with a touch of rock, flooded the room. The sound reproduction equipment was excellent, nigh perfect. Tarantella Serpentine began to dance. It was a strange, hybrid sort of dance, a synthesis of belly dancing, go-go and modern ballet. George licked his lips, and he felt his face get warm, and his penis begin to throb and swell as he watched. Tarantella Serpentine's dance was even more sensuous than the dance Stella Maris had done when he was being initiated into the Discordian movement. After she had done three dances, Tarantella bowed and left. You must be tired, George, said Drake, resting his hand on George's shoulder. Suddenly, George realised he had been going on almost no sleep, except for the times he dozed off in the car on the way from Mad Dog to the Gulf. He had been under incredible physical and, even more important, emotional pressure. He agreed that he was tired, and praying that he would not be murdered in his sleep, he let Drake lead him to a bedroom. The bed was an enormous four-poster with a cloth of gold canopy. Naked, George slid between cool, crisp sheets, and clutching the top sheet around his neck, lay flat on his back, shut his eyes tight and sighed. That morning he had been on a beach in the Gulf of Mexico, watching naked Mavis masturbate. He had fucked an apple. He'd been to Atlantis. And now he was lying on a downy soft mattress in the home of the chief of all organised crime in America. If he closed his eyes, he might find himself back in the mad dog jail. He shook his head. There was nothing to fear. He heard the bedroom door open. There was nothing to fear. To prove it, he kept his eyes closed. He heard a board squeak. Squeaky boards in this place? Sure, to warn the sleeper that there was someone sneaking up on him. He opened his eyes. Tarantella Serpentine was standing over the bed. Bobby Baby sent me, she said.
sex machine, man. Yeah. Moving, doing it, you know. Yeah. Can I count it off? Yeah. One, two, three. Take don't, take don't, take don't, take don't, take don't, money, make 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 He awoke in the dark, and his instinctive groping motion told him that Tarantella was gone. Instead, Mavis, in a white doctor's smock, stood at the foot of the bed, watching him with large, bright eyes. The darkened Drake bedroom had turned into a hospital ward, and was suddenly brightly lit. How did you get here? he blurted. I mean, how did I get here? So, she said kindly, it's almost all over. You've come through it. And suddenly he realised that he felt not twenty-three, but sixty-three years old. You've won, he admitted. I'm no longer sure who I am. You've won, Mavis contradicted. You've gone through ego loss, and now you're beginning to discover who you really are. Poor old Saul. He examined his hands. Old man's. Wrinkled. Goodman's hands. There are two forms of ego loss, Mavis went on, and the Illuminati are masters of both. One is schizophrenia, the other is illumination. They set you on the first track, and we switched you to the other. You had a time bomb in your head, but we diffused it. Malik's apartment, the Playboy Club, the submarine, and all the other past lives and lost years... By God, Saul Goodman cried. I've got it. I am Saul Goodman, but I am all the other people, too. And all time is this time, Mavis added softly. Saul sat upright, tears gleaming in his eyes. I've killed men. I've sent them to the electric chair seventeen times, seventeen suicides. The savages who cut off fingers or toes or ears for their gods are more sensible. We cut off whole egos, thinking they are not ourselves, but separate. Oh, God, God, God. He burst into sobs. Mavis rushed forward and held him, cradling his head to her breast. Let it out, she said. Let it all out. It's not true unless it makes you laugh. But you don't understand until it makes you weep. Gruad the Greyface, Saul screamed, weeping, beating his fist against the pillow as Mavis held his head, stroked his hair. Gruad the Damned, and I have been his servant, his puppet, sacrificing myself on his electric altars as burnt offerings. Mavis cooed in his ear. Yes, yes, we must learn to give up our sacrifices, not our joys. They have taught us to give up everything except our sacrifices, and those are what we must give up. We must sacrifice our sacrifices. The gray face, the life hater, soul shriek, the bastard motherfucker, Osiris Quetzalcoatl. I know him under all his aliases. Gray face, gray face, gray face. I know his wars and his prisons, the young boys he shafts up the ass, the George Dorns he tries to turn into killers like himself, and I have served him all my life. I have sacrificed men on his bloody pyramid. Let it out, Mavis repeated, holding the old man's trembling body. Let it all out, baby. The funny part... So sad, smiling, while a few tears still flowed. Is that I'm not ashamed of this. Two days ago, I would have rather died than be seen weeping, especially by a woman. Yes, Mavis said. Especially by a woman. That's it, isn't it? So gasped. That's their whole gimmick. I couldn't see you without seeing a woman. I couldn't see that editor Jackson without seeing a Negro. I couldn't see anybody without seeing the attached label and classification. That's how they keep us apart, Mavis said gently. And that's how they train us to keep our masks on. Love was the hardest bond for them to smash. So they had to create patriarchy, male supremacy, and all that crap. 
and the masculine protest and penis envy in women came in as a result. So even lovers couldn't look at one another without seeing a separate category. Oh, my God, my God, so man, beginning to weep heavily again. A rag, a bone, a hank of hair. Oh, my God. And you were with them, he cried suddenly, raising his head. You're a former Illuminatus. That's why you're so important to Hagbard's plan, and that's why you have that tattoo. I was one of the five who run the U.S. Avis nodded. One of the insiders, as Robert Welch calls them. I've been replaced now by Atlanta Hope, the leader of God's Lightning. I've got it, I've got it! So said laughing. I looked every way but the right way before. He's inside the Pentagon. That's why they built it in that shape, so he couldn't escape. The Aztecs, the Nazis, and now us. Yes, Mavis said grimly. That's why 30,000 Americans disappear every year without trace, and their cases end up in the unsolved files. He has to be fed. A man, though naked, may be in rags, so quoted. Ambrose Bierce knew about it. And Arthur Mackin, Mavis added, and Lovecraft. But they had to write in code. Even so, Lovecraft went too far, mentioning the Necronomicon by name. And that's why he died so suddenly when he was only forty-seven. And his literary executor, August de Leth, was persuaded to insert a note in every edition of Lovecraft's works, claiming that the Necronomicon doesn't exist and was just part of Lovecraft's fantasy. So asked... And the dolls? Real, Avis said. All real. That's what causes bad acid trips and schizophrenia. Psychic contact with them when the ego wall breaks. That's where the Illuminati was sending you when we raided their fake Playboy Club and short-circuited the process. Du Hexen Hasse, so quoted. And he began to tremble. Unheimlich! Ugh, Vater, whose art's uneven. Horrid be thine aim. Harpoons in him, corpus whalem. Take ye and hate. 